So question number one, um, and there's not a reference to one of the passages specifically, so I hope you guys know what this is referring to, but the question was, how do you explain the difference between Romans 1, 4, which says that Christ was born again at the ascension, versus the Psalms, which speak of the Messiah as begotten at the resurrection? I'm, I'm assuming that's a reference to uh, one of my presentations in which I referred to Thank you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Which I referred to the rebirth of Jesus. And my, my specific point was that Psalms 2 7 and the application of it in Hebrews 5 and Acts chapter 13, 31, and 33 is that he was reborn, begotten, uh, begotten again, if you please, uh, at his resurrection, not his ascension, but at the resurrection. This day, referring to his resurrection, uh, this day, thou. I have begotten you. You are my son. This day have I begotten thee. So that was the specific point. Perhaps the question gets to the fact, okay, if Jesus was begotten again into the realm of the spirit, then why did he still have that physical body? I don't know if that's the gist of that, but perhaps it is. And in case it is, I would refer to Alan's uh, presentation last night, which goes a long way toward explaining that. Jesus had to appear, appear in the physical body as a sign, and David did a great, great job of delineating, delineating that. Jesus' physical resurrection was a physical sign of the greater spiritual reality. I think I did that in less than two minutes. Anybody? <laughs> okay, question number two. Uh, David Curtis, in your presentation, you spoke about the eunuch and the dry tree idea, which I know that Don has commented on before as well regarding the Gentiles. Um, is that more evidence, and can you explain what that was referring to as well um, for the dichotomy between Israel and the nations or the Gentiles? Well, I think for if you want a good explanation on that, Don. <laughs> no, seriously, because, you know, he's really dealt with that whole eunuch thing, and I, you know, I just read through the passage that it happened to be in, so I really didn't do the research on the whole idea of the eunuch there, but I've heard Don do it. So, therefore, Don? Eunuchs, according to Deuteronomy chapter 23, were completely excluded from the tabernacle of God. They were not allowed uh, to enter into the temple of God. Now, understanding the temple was divided into different elements. You had the court of the Gentiles, you had the court of Israel, the court of women, the court of priests, etc. Well, the, the eunuchs were only allowed in the court of the nations. They were not allowed into the court of Israel. There's some controversy about that in the ancient sources. But the point of fact is they were excluded from the tabernacle. They were considered outsiders. They were called dry trees. Why? Well, because Israel as a nation was created through marrying, giving in marriage, natural conjugal relations between a man and woman producing sons of God uh, through natural childbirth. A eunuch couldn't do that. He could not produce sons of God. But now, Isaiah 58 said, even the eunuchs in the Messianic temple will be able to be called green trees. Why? Because they bear fruit. What's the fruit? What's the fruit? Sons of God. Mm -hmm. This has profound implications for who could enter into, because he then uses the word foreigner, alogenes, and alophulis are the Greek words that are used in the Septuagint. Those who are not of the blood of Israel, those who are not of the tribes of Israel, would be able to enter into the Messianic temple. I'll leave it at that. But it, boy, folks, I tell you, that whole concept of the eunuch is rich. Get my presentation on the temple of God from last year's mm -hmm. Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. I think there's copies of it on the table back there. Okay. Yeah, I believe that's where you went into that thoroughly, the last year's PPW. Um, okay, question three. What do you believe is the resurrection of the unjust, and when do you believe this happens or happened? I believe William wants to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> the resurrection of the unjust. First of all, let me start with um, just a little definition of uh, the word anastasis. It, just, it means to cause to stand or to stand up, and it doesn't necessarily mean a body coming out of a ground uh, you can use resurrection from that point of view. You can also use resurrection to talk about reuniting a soul in a relationship to God. That's resurrection. Um, there's a, a passage in Acts 9.41, when Dorcas was raised from the dead, she had already come to life, and then the Bible says Peter took her hand and lifted her up. Well, the word lifted, I think that's the King James word, uh, that word is anastasis, raised up. So there are a lot of definitions. Another is to, uh, in Matthew 22, when it talks about raising up seed to his brother, 
That's the same word, anastasis, and that has to do with being born, which Don just illustrated when he talked about uh, uh, begotten again from the dead. And then you have the concept of causing something to stand or appear. Uh, from that perspective, the just were condemned, according to John chapter 3. It says those who believe not are condemned already. Well, in John chapter 5, uh, the resurrection is not that of going from something spiritual to something physical. It's that which is causing what, is, what already is to stand, just as I was illustrating in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says they would be found uh, in terms of judgment, God exposing them, being without a garment. So that was what the resurrection of the unjust was about. It was about declaring God's judgment that separated unbelieving Israel from believing Israel. That's as simple as I can make it for right now. Anybody else? So the standing would be the the uh, putting in place of being considered unjust, basically at that point. Yes, it would be causing to stand or to manifest mm -hmm. the judgment that was already on them. For example, in, in uh, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, he says, I will cause them who say they are Jews and are not to come and worship before your feet. That's also 1 John 3, uh, where it says the world does not did not know us because it did not know him their status as sons of God was not revealed. They didn't have all the outward trappings of the temple, the sacrifices, and all of those things that you could see. So it appeared that they, you know, that the tares, if you please, were the wheat uh, during that 40-year transition period. And so that, uh, Colossians 3 is another text where he says, for you are dead, your life is hid with Christ in God. So the saints, in terms of manifesting their glory, which is what Dunn was talking about in his lesson, about manifesting the deity of Christ, as that text says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you appear with him also in glory. That's Philippians 3.21 as well. But the dead, excuse me, the, the unbelieving who were persecuting them, those were the ones whose judgment had already been declared, but it wasn't manifested, and so the destruction of the temple in 70 AD revealed that they were the unjust, they were not the sons of God, and therefore that's the resurrection of the unjust from that perspective. So it's a declaration of judgment, basically. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, question number four. Would you argue, and I think this is more towards Gerald Kratt in the presentation you gave, would you argue that the nature of the body, speaking of individuals, is as a tripartite, soul, spirit, flesh, separated by three, or a bipartite, where soul and spirit is combined, and then you have the flesh as the second part of that? Or would you suggest that the Hebrew understanding is that the individual body is a unified soma comprised of the whole? Well, I think that the Hebrew view was uh, very mixed and varied over the years, and that was what I was trying to communicate. Um, I think the emphasis I was trying to come to in my uh, uh, speech was that the proper understanding is the understanding that we get from Jesus and the apostles. Um, I believe that some of the work that's been done on uh, the nature of how the Hebrews understood man it was mostly suggest that he was a unified whole, one part, and that when he died, he just died and there was nothing left. But there were also those Hebrews who thought that the soul did continue to exist. It's, I'll just say that I'm still searching and trying to figure out the answer. I, I have caution on this because Jesus did say that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were living and not dead. Now, what we make of that is another subject. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that we have, in our nature without God, we are probably maybe, say, mono part, that when you die, you die. That's kind of where I'm at with annihilationalism, I think, at this point, although I'm still open to other ideas on that. But I think that man, when he has the spirit of God within him and he's regenerated through faith, that that is the part of him that lives on. So if you want to call that two parts, fine. I don't think it's two parts. I think it's we're a unified, holistic being. I don't separate those things out as individual parts, but I'm okay with describing them as parts of the whole. I don't know if I've made any sense on that or not. But Okay, anyone else want to? Well, first of all, I, I concur 100% with the multivaried uh, nature of uh, Hebraic belief in resurrection and even the body and what have you. Uh, that becomes very, very, very apparent when you study some of the sources that Gerald mentioned. There are a couple of passages in the New Testament that seem that seem to give a, a, a slightly different nuance from what we normally would say is the Hebraic thought. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray that the Lord would keep 
you whole and complete body, soul, and spirit until the day of the Lord. Body, soul, spirit. Well, that doesn't sound purely Hebraic. That almost sounds Platonic on one level. But it's not Platonic in the pure sense of the word. You know, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged soul, uh, able to discern between body and spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there seems to be a distinction, but what is that distinction? Uh, I particularly appreciated Gerald's presentation last night because it, it, it shows us how important it is to get back into the real, honest to goodness, what the German scholars would call the Setz in Leben, the life situation of the first century people. And N.T. Wright has said this many, many times. It is simply improper to say that there is one view of what the Jews believed on anything. Mm -hmm. Kind of like modern-day Christians. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Just, just one comment on, on that. Um, I would also suggest that as you take a look at passages like the one Don quoted, Body, Soul, and Spirit there, um, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, when... Um, they, that guy who's having immoral relations with his mother-in-law, whatever Paul says, turning him over to the, um, Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That's a real poor interpretation there because it's not uh, turning him over for the destruction of his flesh so he will be saved. It's literally a definite article. It, the, the pronoun is not there. It's the flesh for the destruction, for the save, saving of the soul. Um, so I would suggest that in some of those contexts where body, spirit, soul, flesh are used, uh, I take a more corporate nature even in those texts that Paul is referring to that local church that he was wanting to circumcise the wickedness so that the soul of the church would be saved. So that's another possible way to read some of those texts. So as you're considering these things, um, be careful to make sure that the text you're using to interpret the nature of man or the composition of man is actually talking about that. Context, context, context. Okay, next question. Uh, and this probably goes more towards, um, you know, you younger guys that are uh, pastoring and, and some of the things, although all of you, any of you could answer this, but um, how would you oversee a funeral and how would you relay the state of the dead person both in or not in Christ, especially in light of William's Second Corinthians 5, how, you know, that's typically read at funerals, things like that. Um, yeah. I'm not young. Anybody can answer this. <laughs> Especially those in church we ministry. know that, William, but it's okay. But you dealt with 2 Corinthians 5. Well, I'll tell you the way that I deal with funerals most of the, most of the time anymore. I, I really don't talk about the dead and where they are. I talk to the living mm -hmm. and their need for a relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't preach an evangelistic sermon, you know, and I don't have a, quote, altar call per se. But I very, very often say, you know, this person's, in the hands of the Lord for him to receive. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. Well, it's a whole lot different this year <laughs> from all of our past Preterist Pilgrim Weekends, as obviously you know. Due, the, due to the coronavirus, we're just simply not able. We just don't feel safe, although things are starting to return to normal, and for that we're extremely thankful. But we made the decision a good while ago to go ahead and cancel the on-site Preterist Pilgrim Weekend for 2020. Hopefully, Lord willing, next, next year we'll be able to pick it back up. You'll be able to come back and enjoy some of the absolutely fantastic fellowship that you have come to know and come to expect for Preterist Pilgrim Weekend. Now, obviously this is an awful, awful lot different, and what I'm going to do is I, I will have a brief video intro to each one of the speakers. We've got some new speakers this year. I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, we have some standbys. Uh, those who have been part of our conference, obviously we have William Bell, who's been part of every Preterist Pilgrim Weekend, with the exception of one. Uh, we have Daniel Rogers with us. And we, again, we have some new speakers. I will introduce them at the appropriate place. We're going to, uh, going to kick off here in, in a moment with an introduction to our very first speaker this year, and that's Daniel Rogers. But before I get into that, I want to express my profound appreciation to my webmaster, Alan Morton. Alan has worked 
tremendously hard to put together this video conference. Now, one of the things that he has done, for instance, is he, is he has created a virtual uh, book table. And what we have done for this year's PPW, uh, you know, normally when you come to PPW, you are eager to purchase books. And that's because we give great discounts and you don't have to pay shipping. Well, guess what? This year, with the radical change that has been necessary, we have created, Alan has created, virtual book tables. So here's what we have done. We are offering our books, DVDs, MP3s, etc., everything in our inventory at greatly reduced prices. In some instances, even, even reduced more than if, it were, if you were here in person. And on any purchase of $15 or more, we're going to pay the shipping. We've got some great bundle uh, deals, some package deals. Uh, some of the package deals that I have offered, for instance, on my morning musings that have been so well received. And so what this means is you will be able to purchase books this year at even a greater discount than if you were here. I mean, you can't beat a deal like that. So take advantage of our virtual book table. Now, look, I, I know that you're excited. I'm excited about our theme for Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. Our theme this year is the book of Revelation. We've never done it, done a seminar on the book of Revelation. I suspect, I suspect, this is not confirmed, but I kind of think that we'll probably do a follow-up next year. Because let's face it, in one seminar of, you know, 10 to, 10 to 11 speeches, there's no way in this world to do a systematic study of the book of Revelation. It's just too vast. But we're going to have lessons focused on, for instance, the seven churches of Asia and their impact on the overall eschatology of Revelation. Daniel Rogers will be sharing that with us. We're going to have lessons. Uh, Scott Fisher, for instance, will be talking to us about the synagogue of Satan and how important that is for understanding the book of Revelation. These are just some of the, some of the themes, subjects, and topics that are going to be covered. Daniel Rogers will begin this evening, kick off our Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. Now look, I don't think that I have to do a whole lot of introduction for, da uh, for Daniel Rogers at this point. Uh, as I mentioned, he has been a speaker here in the past. He, he has always done a fantastic job. We appreciate the good in-depth research that he does, how logically, concisely, he presents his lessons that makes them so easy to understand and powerful to catch. And so he's going to begin uh, our Preterist Pilgrim Weekend this year with his lessons that are going to develop the idea and of the relationship between the seven churches of Asia and the eschatology of the book of Revelation. Uh, Daniel is currently serving as a minister uh, and has a side job, if you please, in Florida. Uh, Daniel has tremendous promise for the preterist movement. I know every single time that I've had him fill in for me on my preterist pilgrim weekend, or excuse me, on my morning musings, uh, the response has been fantastic. And so I know that you're going to thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy Daniel Rogers and his examination the seven churches of Asia, and the eschatology of Revelation. I know you'll look forward to it. So here's Daniel. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to PPW, which I guess stands for Preterist Pandemic Weekend. It is good to be with you through video. I would much rather be with you in person, but we have to do what we have to do. One of the things I love about Preterist Pilgrim Weekend is, of course, the lectures and things like that, but those can be videotaped. You know, we can capture those and watch those over and over and over again or take extensive notes or whatever you want to do. But what we're going to miss out on this year 
is to me my favorite part. Those little conversations you have at IHOP or, you know, the uh, little debates, mini debates that you might have about a lesson in between the lectures, you know, during the five or 10 minutes, however much time Don allows, you know. So those are the little interactions that I'm going to miss the most, and especially getting to see all my friends and family, frankly, uh, each year, that's going to be a big sacrifice to make, but I understand the necessity for that. My lessons are going to be about the letters to the seven churches of Asia. In fact, the first lesson I'm going to be talking about today is entitled, You Only Really Need to Study Revelation 1-3, to and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. My second lesson is going to be about the book of John as a commentary, so to speak, on the book of Revelation. I'm really excited about that lesson, and I hope uh, you'll be too once we get there. To introduce both of my lessons, though, we need to show that both Revelation and John are creation stories. Both of them are about the formation of the new heavens, new earth, new creation, which is in Christ. One of the things I want to bring up, though, is that in, in uh, Genesis, in the Genesis commentary, uh, the JPS commentary on the book of Genesis, this is said, there is abundant evidence that other cosmologies once existed in Israel. That is outside of the biblical cosmology we receive in uh, Genesis chapter 1 through 3. Scattered allusions uh, to be found in the prophetic, poetic, and wisdom literature in the Bible testify to a popular belief that prior to the onset of the creative process, the powers of watery chaos had to be subdued by God. These mythical beings are variously designated the sea, the river, the coiled one, the arrogant one, the dragon, all of them having names that I don't wish to try to pronounce. And there is no consistency in these fragments regarding the ultimate fate of these creatures. One version has them utterly destroyed by God, and another, the chaotic forces personal, uh, pers personified as monsters are put under restraint by his power. Th that was basically said to say this. The Genesis story that we have in Genesis 1 is one of many creation myths that the ancient Near Eastern world uh, held to. Now, obviously, the one that we have is the one put into the scripture, but these others existed. And the book of Revelation specifically pulls from those creation narratives to tell yet another creation story. And that's what the book of Revelation is. It's, it's basically the genesis of the New Testament, telling the story of the new heavens and new earth that comes about after this cosmic battle between uh, the beasts and the and the dragon, you know, the, the Leviathan, as you see in uh, the other creation, er creation narratives, even in Scripture. So both Revelation, and as we're going to see in the next lesson, the book of John, are stories of creation. And so that's going to be really beneficial to see, especially once we get into the second lesson. But I knew it would be helpful for you now. And that's, again, in the JPS Genesis uh, commentary, the JPS Torah commentaries on the book of Genesis. Uh, basically the first page, the commentary on Genesis 1, 1 through 2, verse 3. So, that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get into my lesson for the day. The lesson for the day is entitled, You Only Really Need to Study Revelation 1 to 3. Now, obviously, this is there's some sarcasm there. You know, I'm obviously joking. Uh, but I'm talking about, though, and referencing a very real problem and very real experience that many Christians had when studying the book of Revelation. The bulk of lessons that preachers and Bible class teachers give on the Revelation are typically focused around Genesis 1 through 3. And maybe, depending on what tradition uh, you associate with, you might go to you know Revelation 20 through 22 as well. Most of the time people go to Revelation chapter 20 to talk about why premillennialism is either right or wrong. No other reason really to go there besides uh, you know scaring the congregation into coming down the aisle you know, after the invitation song sung. And then Revelation 22 and uh, 21 and 22 are more used to talk about the glory of heaven is the idea that people have about that passage. But we'll address that in due time. The point is, though, is Revelations 4 through 19 go largely unnoticed by, uh, by many within Christianity because it's, quote, too hard or too mystical or the things are too hidden or we can't really know the meaning of those things. And so many people don't even bother uh, studying them or looking at them at all. In fact, uh, because the book of Revelation can be so daunting to many Bible students and teachers, many have only really studied three, four, five, six chapters out of a whole book. The thing is, though, 
is that the very word revelation shows what the purpose of the book is. It's not to hide anything from us or to cover anything up from us, but rather it is to unveil, to explain, to reveal what the kingdom of God is, to reveal what Jesus is, who Jesus is rather, to reveal who God is. That's what the book of Revelation's function is. It's a book of revelation, not of hiding or sealing or covering. And the book tells us that itself, as I'm sure someone will mention from Revelation chapter 22. What is, I don't know if it's irony or not, but many preterists say, well, they only look at Revelation 1 through 3. They don't look at Revelation 4 through 22, right? Where at the same time, these same people, including myself in times past, basically ignore or avoid Revelation 1 through 3, except to go there to get the time statements. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Revelation 1 through 3, not just the time statements, contains very valuable keys to understanding the rest of the book. Uh, different uh, symbols and themes and just all kinds of things can be found in Revelation 1 through 3, specifically, in our case, the letters, the seven letters of the churches of Asia. Now, one of the other things that Revelation 1 through 3 has in common with the rest of the book is there's many times similar Old Testament scripture references that can be found in Revelation 1 through 3 that are discussed later in 4 through 22. But you wouldn't know that if the only reason, the only value that you see in Revelation 1 through 3 is in its time statements. So this is a encouragement to you to really dig into those first three chapters. So to demonstrate the importance of the first three chapters of the Revelation, with a hyper focus on chapters two and three later in the lesson. We will study the layout of chapters one through three. We're gonna take a look at the connection between chapter one and chapters two and three to show that it's a continued discussion. And then we're gonna look at the relationship between the letters to the seven churches of Asia and the rest of the book of Revelation as a whole. So uh, one, of those, one of those sections is a little bit weightier than the other two, but I hope that you'll appreciate the necessity of going to these first few chapters first before jumping right in to the main point of the lesson. So we're talking about the layout of Revelation chapters 1 through 3. First we see in Revelation chapter 1 uh, that the purpose of the book is introduced, that the audience is introduced, and then finally in Revelation chapter 1 the Christ is introduced. The purpose of the book of Revelation, of course, as we've already mentioned, is to reveal. The book announces that the time is near. These things are at hand. That's found in Revelation chapter 1, 1 and Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. The book of Revelation chapter 1 also uh, teaches us that he has made us to be a kingdom, that it's the people, the church, that make up the kingdom, that the people themselves constitute this new kingdom. That's going to be important later when we talk about the struggle between these two kingdoms, between these two cities, between the, uh, the Michael and the dragon between Christ and the dragon and between, of course, the harlot and the bride later on. So the kingdom is the people. He's made us to be a kingdom. Another major point that we find in Revelation chapter 1 is found in verse 7, and that is, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Uh, this passage um, comes from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. But this passage, Revelation 1, 7, also has very strong similarities. I mean, down to the Greek words and phrases to Matthew chapter 24, 29 through 31. And I would really encourage you to take out a Strong's Concordance or a, you know, a, a lexicon and really compare those two passages, especially the specific words that are used. And the final thing that we see in these first 11 verses of Revelation chapter one is this uh, command, you know, send this to the seven churches, the seven churches there in Asia Minor. And we're gonna talk about why that is hopefully in a little bit. Verses 12 through 16 uh, de describe Jesus from John's perspective. He's clothed in a robe. He has a golden sash. He has head and hair, white like wool. Notice the correlation between these descriptions and the description of the ancient one that you see in Daniel chapter 7. All right. He has eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, voice like the sound of many waters, seven stars in his right hand, a, a sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. We'll talk about that later too. And he has a face like the sun. Again, it would be really beneficial for you to compare this section of scripture, verses 12 through 16 of Revelation 1, to the description of the ancient one in Daniel chapter 7. Very similar uh, descriptions are used. 
in Revelation 1, 17 through 20, Jesus gives some introductory remarks. He says, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I am the one that was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. He says, furthermore, I have the keys of death and of Hades. And he says, the seven stars that you saw, those are the seven angels and the seven lamps or the seven churches. And so Jesus gives some very quick introductory remarks first here in Revelation 1, 17 through 20, before getting to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, which contain seven epistles to the seven churches introduced earlier uh, in chapter 1. Now, each letter in Revelation 2 to 3 borrows from the first chapter specifically concerning the descriptions of Jesus, but we'll get to that in a moment. The layout of each letter is also the same. It starts with a salutation to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? Followed directly by a description of Jesus taken from either chapter one, and in some cases, chapter 19. We'll get to that later. And then it immediately uh, brings about an evaluation of that church. I know your works, this, right? Your work of love, etc. And in f five out of the seven churches, it's followed by this. But this I have against you. So you have a salutation, you have an evaluation, and then you have the promise or the blessing, the beatitude. To him who overcomes, blank. I'll give you a crown of life. I'll, you'll, you'll be able to eat of the tree of life. You know, all those blessings that are found in Revelation 2 and 3. Each church, uh, the spiritual state of each church, represents a different potential situation in any first century church. We're going to study the spiritual states of each of these churches momentarily, but uh, each one represents a possible situation that any first century church might find them in. And that's why I think these seven churches uh, were chosen. There's arguments you can make about uh, the, the routes that the Roman military would take and things like that, and, and I have no problem with any of those explanations. But from a practical standpoint, it seems like the situation that each of these seven churches were in stood as a representation of all of the churches, right? Which is why you have Paul, and possibly, in Hebrews chapter 12, referencing Revelation, or Peter drawing from Revelation in 2 Peter 3, you know, because these letters didn't just go to the seven churches in Asia, they're obviously uh, widely circulated around, and the seven churches of Asia stood as a representation of the larger body of Christ. Not that he didn't write specifically to those seven churches, just that uh, they, they represent a larger problem that the church was having. That's also going to be seen in the similarities uh, that some of the churches, the problems that some of the churches face. We're not going to be able to get into those today, but I would encourage you maybe to go uh, find some of the lectures I gave on the Letters to the Seven Churches on my YouTube channel. So another thing we have to point out is the Letters to the Seven Churches are laid out chiastically. What I mean by that is they mirror one another in a certain pattern um, in regards to the spiritual status of each church. Specifically, the faithfulness of the churches again, mirror and fold in on one another, with Thyatira being the center of the chiasmus. Ephesus and Laodicea, for example, were in need of total repentance. There are no mention of any faithfulness in that church, any faithful individuals in either of those two churches. The churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia were both considered faithful. Uh, Pergamum and Sardis, they had an uneven mixture of faithfulness. In one of the churches, there was more faithful than unfaithful. In the other church, there was more unfaithful than faithful. So there's an uneven mixture. And finally, the church at Thyatira seemed to have a pretty even mixture of individuals that were faithful and individuals that had given in to the, doc to the uh, doctrine of Balaam or whomever. Um, see Second Peter 2. There's a strong connection with the Judaizers there. But again... That's a uh, story for a different time. So the seven churches of Asia are laid out chiastically. And notice that Thyatira is the center. Okay, Thi Thyatira is the anchor point or the hinge upon which the whole chiasmus operates. And that's going to be extremely important when we get into the relationship between Revelation 2 and 3 and Revelation 4 through 22 later on in the lesson. The church at Thyatira not only is the center, but it also happens to be the longest of the seven letters. Again, I think that speaks to its importance. The connections between Revelation 1 and Revelation 2 and 3 
um, lie in their strong emphasis on the imminence of the parousia or the apocalypse or the coming of Christ. Um, it also uh, the 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 uh, connection between Revelation chapter one and Revelation chapter two and three also lie in the descriptions of Jesus, as we're going to uh, notice a little bit later. So the first chapter strongly emphasizes the imminence of the revelation, the things which must soon take place, Revelation 1.1. For the time is near, Revelation 1.3, the things that are about to come, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, according to the uh, Young's literal translation. In the second and third chapters, the same thing happens. I am coming to you, Revelation 2.5. I am coming quickly, Revelation 2.16. Hold fast until I come, uh, John writes to living, breathing Christians in Revelation 2.25. You will not know at what hour I will come to you, Revelation 3, verse 3. I stand at the door and knock, Revelation 3.20. Possible reference to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24.31, the judge stands at the door, which is similar to what James says when referencing Jesus's uh, discourse on the Mount of Olives in James chapter 5. The only stands at the door. All three chapters also speak of the tribulation as a current threat. John says in Revelation 1 9, I, John, your fellow partaker in the tribulation. Revelation 2 10 says, The devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Side note If Satan is bound for a thousand years and he's about to cast some of them into prison in Revelation 2 10, could it be that the thousand-year reign had already ended at this point, and they were entering into the short time of Revelation 12, which follows the thousand-year reign, in which Satan was loosed and active and seeking to persecute the church, seeking to destroy the church? Think about it. Think about it. It's a possibility. Maybe even suggest 1 Peter 5, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking who may, who may devour. And he also said in First Peter chapter 1 that they had a little while of suffering, which happens to correspond to the little while of Revelation 6. But I'll let you, you know, I'll let you have fun with that one. All right. Now, Revelation 3.10 says this, and this is very interesting. He says, the hour of testing, which is about to come upon the whole world. Sound familiar? Acts 17.30, of course, says, uh, Acts 17, 30 and 31, he's now commended all men everywhere to repent. A few chapters later, when Paul is on trial, he talks about the judgment that's going to come upon the whole world. Well, here it is, Revelation 3.10, the hour of testing which is about to come upon the whole world, Revelation 3.10. So all three chapters, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, stress the imminence of the coming of the Lord, but also stress the current threat, not a future threat, <clears throat> but a current, very real threat of Great Tribulation. Chapters 2 through 3 also use the description of Jesus that was introduced in chapter 1, and in some cases, descriptions of Jesus that are used later in Revelation chapter 19. So, looking at chapter 1 verses, you know, all, all the way down really to the, to the end of the chapter, uh, Jesus held seven stars in his right hand. He walked among the lampstands. He was the called the first and the last. He's called the one who is dead. He has a sharp two-edged sword. He has eyes like a flame of fire. He has feet like burnished bronze. And those are all used to introduce Jesus in the uh, salutation given to each of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 3, we have the seven spirits and the seven stars in 3.1. Uh, Jesus is described as the one who holds the key of David in Revelation 3.7. He's described as the Amen, the faithful, the true witness in 3.14. And he's described as the beginning of the creation in chapter 3 and verse 14 as well. Now, what's interesting about these parallels is not necessarily in their similarities, but in their differences. And by that, I mean two differences. In one passage, Revelation chapter 1, or rather Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 3, it says that Jesus has the key of David. But in chapter 1... It says he had the keys of Hades and death. This is more interesting, though. Revelation 3, it calls Jesus the beginning or the, uh, the one who originates, the one who brings about, who produces, the one who births, uh, creation. Whereas in, and I uh, almost said Colossians for a reason, <laughs> but in Revelation 1, the scripture defies, defines Jesus as the firstborn of the dead. Now, these two differences to me are fascinating. 
because it teaches us something, as we're going to see, about the nature of the new creation and about the nature of the resurrection. But I'll save that here for a little bit. These two basic similarities, to make my point, impact the rest of the book. For example, all the words or phrases used to describe the uh, imminence of the coming of the Lord in Revelation 1 through 3 are reiterated in uh, chapter 6 as well as in chapter 22 together. For example, soon take place, Revelation 1 1 is discussed again in Revelation 22 verse 6. The time is near, Revelation 1 3 corresponds to Revelation 22 10, who are about to be killed. If of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 11, the, mel the word mellow there corresponds to its use in Revelation 1 19, the things which are about to take place. I'm coming quickly as it's used in Revelation 2 16, Revelation 3 11 is used three times in Revelation 22, 22 7, 22 12, and 22 20. The point is both the beginning of the book, Revelation 1 through 3, as well as Revelation 22 and throughout the book, even many other places we haven't even got to strongly emphasize the imminence of the events of the revelation. All right. So they all, it strongly emphasizes the imminence of these events throughout the book. Now, another point is that the script, the description of Jesus in chapters uh, one through three resembles the description of Jesus in chapter 19, 11 through 16. Jesus is called the faithful and true in both chapter 19 and in verse 14 of chapter 3. Jesus is going, going to go out to wage war with the sword of his mouth, as it's mentioned in Revelation 2.16 and also in Revelation 19. He has eyes like flaming fire. He has a sharp two-edged sword, and he's going to rule with an art rod of iron. Revelation 2.27, again, it's reiterated in Revelation 19. The point is, out of all this, that this book is not... You know, you can't just break this book up into sections and read those sections independently of one another. It is irresponsible to stop at chapter 3 and skip to chapter 20. But it's it's equally irresponsible to start in chapter 6 and skip over chapters 1 through 3 as well as sometimes 4 and 5 and just go there to get the time statements. You have to look at the book as a whole, and when you do that, you get a more complete picture of the book of Revelation, a well-rounded picture. And... With that, a better appreciation for the last book of the Bible. Now, let me go back to something I hinted at a second ago. In Revelation chapter 3, it says that Jesus is the beginning of the creation. In Revelation chapter 1, though, it calls him the firstborn of the dead. Now, when you look at Revelation chapter 20 through 22, the resurrection that's pictured there and the new heavens and new earth are closely correlated. See, Revelation 20 through 22 is participation with Christ in what was already true for him in Revelation chapter 1 through 3. So this means that if we can identify the nature of the new heavens and new earth, which we'll be working very hard to do in uh, the lesson on John in the next lesson, then we can identify the nature of the resurrection. You see? So it's, it's really fascinating when you see these parallels and these connections between uh, Jesus' introduction in chapter 1 and his descriptions in chapter 2 and 3. Now, let's move to the meat of the discussion. We're going to spend the final 20 minutes, hopefully, on this. And that is the relationship between Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and Revelation chapters 4 through 22. The first one, and this is huge, um, at the end of each church, uh, at the end of each epistle to the church in Revelation 2 and 3, there is a blessing. To him who overcomes, I will give X, 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 Y, and Z, right? Well, those blessings are qualities of the new heavens and the new earth, as we're going to see momentarily. But here's something else about those blessings. Every one of those blessings relates to resurrection. For example, he says you're going to eat of the tree of life, obviously restoring what was seen to be, uh, what appeared to be lost in Adam in Genesis chapter two and three. He talks about having a new name, which goes right into what uh, Jesus' whole discussion with the Sadducees was in the book of Matthew and their question about the woman who had seven husbands. And if you look through it, every single one of those blessings relates to resurrection. 
and it is presented to them as a possibility now, not as a possibility, you know, thousands of years in the future. All the blessings would 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 uh, be true to them, or appear to them, or be revealed to them in an at hand period of time. But for our purposes today, we're going to look at the blessings of Revelation two and three, and how they are qualities of the new heavens and new earth. The first blessing sets the stage for the rest. In Revelation chapter one and verse seven, the scripture says, "He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes." I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this blessing sets the stage for the rest of the blessings because it presents the location that these other blessings are found in, namely within the paradise of God. The paradise that is seen as coming down out of heaven in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 to be among men, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. So, all of the other blessings have to do with this new heavens and new earth, this paradise, this abode of God. For example, the tree of life is discussed later in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. The promise to the church at Smyrna to not be hurt by the second death is given to the saints in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. This idea of eating the hidden manna, uh, you know, Participating in this meal with Christ in Revelation 2.17 is seen fulfilled in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9 at the wedding feast of the Lamb. The authority over the nations in the morning star of Thyatira in Revelation 2.26-28 is reiterated again in Revelation 24 when we see not only the nations coming in in the uh, end of chapter uh, at the end of uh, chapter 21 but we see the saints ruling with Christ in Revelation 20, verse 4. We see it for the church at Sardis that they would be given white garments. We see that uh, come true in Revelation 21, 27. The temple of God is discussed and for the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3, 12. Again, we see that the Lamb and God are its temple in Revelation 21, 22. And the saints would be able to participate as a part of that temple. In the church at Laodicea, in that letter, he said that they would be able to sit with Jesus on the throne. You see that again in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. The point is, is that each of these blessings have parallels in the end of the book of Revelation, specifically because they all have to do with resurrection. Now, one other thing about these blessings, we're not going to get into this in too much detail now, um, but I want you to be able to do this on your own time. If you go and you look at all the individual blessings, the you're not going to be hurt by the second death. I'm going to give you the hidden manna. Um, you're, I'm, going to, I'm going to make your garments white. Right? You're going to be a pillar in the temple. Go and study the words of Jesus and of his apostles in the other books. These promises can be found everywhere. I mean, just all over the place, especially in the book of John, as we're going to study later. And so, and all those blessings, by the way, are presented as present realities, not about something that's going to happen after death. They can be accessed now through Christ. Now, just to give you an idea of how extensive the relationship is between Revelation uh, 2 and 3 and the rest of the book, there are at least 25 or so additional connections uh, between those two chapters and the rest of the book. And I've got them here. <laughs> I've worked hard to, to map them out the best I can. And I'm going to be presenting some of those to you, but a lot of those we'll mention in passing. Now, these connections are found in similarity in language, in similarity in the symbols that are used, and maybe even in the principles that are taught. And you'll just have to look into that and you know check it out for yourself to find, see, what, see what it is that you can find. But they are there, and I think you'll benefit greatly from that study. Now, these connections further demonstrate the fact, and this is important, that the book of Revelation documents one revelation that was at hand. Not a revelation that was at hand and a revelation that wasn't at hand, like what Art Ogden suggests in his commentary. He thought that the book of Revelation also had something to do with the fall of Rome later, um, which I don't agree with. But it's one revelation, and what was going to, uh, and everything in that revelation would be fulfilled soon, quickly, at hand, shortly. It was about to take place. All right? Now, here are a few other similarities between Revelation 2 and 3 and the rest of the book that I found. I believe that the false apostles 
of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and as well as those that claim to be Jews but were not, those that were the synagogue of Satan, uh, etc., etc., those correspond to the beasts that you see in Revelation 13, the false prophet, as one of those is called. Furthermore, if you look at the trouble that the church at Ephesus had in the book of Ephesians, in Acts chapter 20, and in Paul's letters to uh, to Timothy, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you can get a pretty good idea that some of those false apostles included guys like Hymenaeus and Philetus in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And so there's more to be unpacked there, but I'm just showing you uh, how vital this reference is to these false apostles in Ephesians chapter 2. But I think that correlates with the false prophet later that's introduced as one of the beasts in uh, the second section of Revelation. We also have here that the sword which proceeds from the mouth of Christ, it speaks of the nature of the kingdom, but it's also reiterated in Revelation 19. Now, quick point about that sword. That sword coming out of his mouth teaches us something about the nature of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't wield a sword, you know, he's going to off with their head type of thing. But the sword that Jesus wields is that that comes out of his mouth. It's the word of God, the gospel, right? That's what he wages war with. Now, the significance of this, I think, it, I don't know if it goes largely unnoticed, but here's what I see in Revelation. I don't see Revelation as Rome versus Jerusalem. I see Revelation as one idea of the kingdom versus another idea of the kingdom. You have on one hand this idea of the kingdom that comes from Isaiah chapter 2, which is their swords will be turned into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This idea of the kingdom that Jesus presents in Matthew 26, he who picks up the sword dies with the sword. The idea of the kingdom that Jesus presents in Luke 19, if you had known the way of peace, but since you don't, you know, your city is going to be surrounded, etc. The nature of the kingdom that Jesus discussed in the book of John. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, soul, my servants would fight. Versus this other idea of the kingdom, which was, we've had enough, we're going to rebel against Rome. Let's take up the sword, let's take up the spear, let's go out and fight. Let's turn our plows, you know, our, our plowshares and the swords, whatever, you know, you get the idea. The point is, is I think Revelation is more about the battle between these two kingdoms, which is why the gospel is the tool that Jesus uses, than it is about Rome and Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem by Rome is the natural conclusion to following the path that the zealots and those that they persuaded did. Okay. Um, let's see. I love that subject. Okay, let's see. So the pestilence of Revelation 2.23, which quite literally could be translated death, corresponds to the ashen horse in Revelation chapter 6. And you'll see it elsewhere through Revelation as well. Here's another big one. In Revelation 3 verse 12, he says, To him who overcomes, uh, I will write on him the name of my God. I think that that stands in contrast to the mark of the beast that's introduced later in the book of Revelation. So there's a lot more in there that you'll be able to find. And if you're so familiar with Revelation, you know, based specifically 6 through 22, stuff's just going to jump off the page at you. And you're going to really appreciate, um, you're really going to appreciate some of those connections that exist. Also take a look at the Old Testament citations and allusions as well. All right. Another point about this is that the main themes of Revelation are introduced in chapters 2 and 3. The main themes of Revelation are introduced in chapters 2 and 3. For example, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Ephesians, uh, not Ephesians chapter 1, ha, Revelation chapter 2, but the epistle concerning Ephesians, the Ephesians. Notice what he says in verse 4. But this I have against you, that you have left your first love. Okay? The church at Ephesus has left their first love being the Christ. Right? Now, look further into Revelation chapter 2 to the church at Thyatira. Now, let's look at verse, uh, let's see, 20. I have this against you, he says, that you, are t that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Obvious reference to, you know, King Ahab and Jezebel in the Old Testament, who calls herself a prophetess. All right, notice the correlation to the false apostles of Revelation chapter 2. Who calls herself a prophetess, 
and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray. So they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I want you to keep in mind this passage and go and read Revelation 17 and 18. What does the harlot do? She causes the kings of the earth to commit fornication with her, right? She's leading the people away from God. And so God tells the people in Revelation 18, come out from among her, O my people. In Revelation 2 and verse 21, he says, I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I'll throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I'll kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll give to each one of you according to your deeds. Who is Jezebel? I strongly believe that Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2 is the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. That is, I think that she's the Judaizers that were trying to lead some of the church away and bring them back under bondage. I strongly believe this. And so Revelation 2 is beneficial because it sets up a theme that's going to be discussed way you know later in the book. All right. Okay, so we also have uh, you know this competition between the bride and the harlot continuing throughout, and of course uh, the bride being victorious. The bride in Revelation 21 correlates to the New Jerusalem, so I think it's safe to say that the harlot in Revelation 17 correlates to the Old Jerusalem. Another thing that we see in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is that Satan and his followers are established as the main antagonists. Um, this reference over and over again to the synagogue of Satan, to the deep things of Satan. Uh, you know, the devil will cast some of you into prison. And this contention is introduced as early as Revelation 2 and 3. And so when we think about identifying Satan and his servants later on in the book, or his messengers later on in the book, I think that it is, I think that it's safe to say that it has something to do with the synagogue of Satan, those who say that they're Jews and are not. That is, those individuals who broke away from the promises of their fathers to chase after this fleshly idea of the kingdom that would only lead to their destruction. Again, we're talking, talking more about that in the next lesson. Another huge part of Revelation 2 and 3 is this emphasis on endurance, the one who endures to the end, right? He who overcomes. And the importance of this is uh, the emphasis of endurance instead of violence. We're going to see this in the next lesson all through the book of Revelation. But I think this is one of the major themes of the book, right? The vindication of the martyrs. Jesus said in uh, Luke chapter 17, he who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life will save it. You have two options when you're being persecuted. You can either take out the sword and fight back like the zealots did, and that led to death, right? He who takes out the sword dies with the sword. Um, or you can submit to it, not go against your faith, not denounce Jesus. And yes, that leads to death, but at the same time, it also preserves the one for whom Christ died, right? So the uh, introduction of Revelation, chapter 1 through 3, arguably chapters 4 and 5, the throne room scenes, set up all these themes of you know, the, the mark of God versus the mark of Satan, the bride versus the harlot, the, the themes of martyrdom, the themes of uh, Satan versus Christ, Sa the messengers of Satan versus the messengers of the seven churches of Asia. These themes are all introduced in chapters 2 and 3. And all of it is fit within this context of these things must soon take place. These things are about to be fulfilled. All right. And I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you without, you know, uh, without explaining every little detail, but I'm hoping that I'm giving you enough information so that you can take this to your own office, to your own bedrooms, your own kitchen table with your uh, books and commentaries and whatever, and, f and fill out all of these ideas. I'm telling you, it'd be really beneficial for you to do. So what have we learned? First off, we've learned that a healthy knowledge of the first three chapters contributes to a better understanding of the entire book, right? If we think of Revelation as introduction, one through three, you know, throne room scene, four and five, first vision, 
uh, 6 through 11, Second Vision, 12 through 19, um, Millennium chapter, and then the, uh, then the New Heavens and New Earth chapter. And we think about them in these separated you know, sort of ways. But once we start to see that the book of Revelation repeats itself over and over and over again from all different types of perspectives, then we can start to understand it even better. And part of that means going back to the roots of Revelation, chapters 1 through 3, and seeing what it's telling us, what it's warning us about, what it's a foreshadowing concerning the rest of the book. If we do this, man, we're going to have a good understanding of the book. Now, the first three chapters are beneficial, as I mentioned before, because they set up many of these themes and symbols that appear later. And when you become familiar with these things as they're introduced in Revelation 2-3, to it helps you understand what they mean later. Well, he says that they were those that said that they were Jews, but were not really, right? Not saying that they weren't uh, in, in terms of their lineage Jewish, but in terms of being children, you know, children of Abraham, they had lost that identity in this. Uh, Abraham wanted a heavenly city, Hebrews chapter 11. They want this earthly city, uh, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. And so you have this contention all throughout, and it identifies who the enemy is, right? In the very first three chapters of the book, These, this holistic view of the Revelation not only does it honor the at hand time frame of the book, but it also keeps in mind who the audience of the book is, which is the seven churches. I feel like when we skip to chapters 4 through 22, uh, we lose sight of who the book was written to. And there's all these questions. Why was it written to the seven churches? Why, why do they get the book? Why not, you know, Thessalonica or somebody else? Well, the reason why is, what we've, one is what we've talked about already, is uh, one, the proximity of Patmos to the seven churches. It's just off the coast. Um, but also because the letters to the seven churches, right, the seven churches had various spiritual states that would be applicable to the wider body of Christ. And their connection to the trade routes and, and roads and things like that would also allow the, the book to spread very quickly, especially considering John's location at the time. I don't think we have to look you know, further than that for a reason as to why the seven churches were the intended uh, audience of this book. Now, one last thing I want to say. The book of Corinth, the you know, the first letter uh, to the Corinthians, differs from the epistles to the seven churches of Asia because the letter to the church at Corinth, it addresses specific people, it addresses specific situations, uh, very detailed answering their questions, things like that. Whereas the book of Revelation and the epistles to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 serve as more general recommendations and uh, general you know, statements of, of discipline or blessing that are applicable to all of the churches. You know, For example, to him overcomes, I'll give him the, the tree of life. Well, he said that specifically to the church at Corinth, but that's also applicable to the other churches as well, obviously. As I mentioned, they all relate to, re to resurrection. So um, I do see Revelation 2 to 3 uh, as, as specifically referring to the seven churches, but at the same time, you can see how their spiritual states answer questions that all the churches would have, all right? So this holistic view honors that audience of the book, um, while at the same time honoring the time frame, and at the same time uh, looking at the book as a whole and not splitting it up into parts and forgetting, you know, one of the sections, specifically chapters two and three. So that's my first lesson, Revelation chapter two and three, or as I called it to begin with, um, you only really need to study chapters two to three. And so I hope now you'll see why that's the case. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next lesson. All right. Well, we appreciate Daniel Rogers' number number one lesson on the on the letters to the seven churches and the eschatology of the book of Revelation. I know we'll be looking forward to his second lesson as a follow-up to that theme. I, I have been thinking for years and years personally that it's so common for commentators to all but divorce the letters to the seven churches from the overall story and, and storyline of the book of Revelation. So it's great to see this development of the inextricable bond between the letters to the seven churches and the rest of the story of Revelation. So again, we appreciate Daniel's approach to this and look forward to a second. Now, 
In the second lesson here in PPW 20 and 20, I'm going to be sharing with you some thoughts on the millennium. I probably don't have to tell you that the millennium is, is almost, at least in some ways, the focal point of modern eschatology. I mean, I don't have to tell you I know that our dispensational friends focus on the millennium. And to a greater extent, or not greater, but certainly to a great extent, post-millennialists as well as all millennialists also place an awful lot of focus on the millennium, although they actually then look beyond the millennium, which they posit as the Christian age, and they look forward to the so-called end of time. I believe that it's a safe statement to make. If a person has the wrong view of the millennium, they have the wrong view of eschatology. To properly identify the millennium and its relationship to the overall story of the Bible is absolutely critical. And so with that in mind, we're going to turn to me, <laughs> Don K. Preston, for my lesson number one on the millennium of Revelation chapter 20. Well, as promised, I'm going to be discussing the millennium found in Revelation chapter 20. Now, to say that there have been an awful lot of ink spilled on the issue of the millennium is a humongous understatement. Uh, in many ways, the millennium is considered to be the key, the, the critical key of interpreting the book of Revelation. Now, there are basically two major views concerning the millennium. Uh, there is... There is the view of the millennium beginning in the first century during the ministry of Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, he cast a, cast a demon out of a young man. He was accused of doing so by the power of the devil. And Jesus said, how do, you, how, how do you spoil the goods of the strong man unless you first enter his house and you bind him? And, of course, he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. If I, by the power of the devil, cast out the devil, then a house is divided. So it's believed that at least at this point, and then in Luke chapter 10, when he sent his apostles out on one of the limited commissions, and they healed and they cast out demons, they came back rejoicing, and Jesus said, well, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. But he said, I beheld Satan cast down from heaven. So once again, it is believed, based upon these two passages and perhaps some others, that the millennium began during the ministry of Jesus. Some say it, that it began with his resurrection and his triumph over uh, Satan, as he said in John chapter 12, 12, 31 and following. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the God of this world to be cast out. And so that is one view I was personally raised in the amillennial view of the millennium, which took the, the view that I just described. And the millennium is defined as the entirety of the Christian age. This is essentially the amillennial as well as the postmillennial view. Both of those positions believe and teach that the second coming of Christ, the new heaven and the new earth, comes at the end of the millennium. They are both, therefore, what can be described as post-millennial. Then, of course, we have what is known as the premillennial view, both historic and dispensational. In this view, the millennium does not begin until the coming of the Lord. And so, in both views, or in, I should say in the dispensational view, the millennium is strictly future. In the amillennial and postmillennial view, the millennium is viewed as present. There are some, you know, there are some variations of these views, and I'll even mention a variation, a third view here momentarily. But most consider the millennium to be an extended long period of time. As just mentioned, the amillennialists and postmillennialists view the entirety of the Christian age as the millennium. Well, that means the millennium has been going on for 2,000 years. 
the dispensationalists have a tendency to literalize the language and, and to say that it is, in fact, a literal thousand years or, you know, give or take a few years. I am going to present the view that the millennium was a roughly 40-year period of time. And by the way, I, I'm going to be saying that the, uh, several times the, that the millennium ended, ended in AD 70. I'm not trying to be exactly precise in that because I will understand that the end of the millennium is the judgment and the coming of the Lord. But according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8, you have an outburst of persecution at the end of the millennium and that outburst of persecution is terminated by the coming of the Lord. And so you technically have the end of the millennium, persecution, coming of the Lord. So again, I'm not trying to be precise when I say that the millennium ended in A.D. 70. I'm giving a, a, if you please, a generic terminus. But nonetheless, I am speaking of, in general terms, a 40-year millennium. And I believe that the millennium corresponds with what is known in the, in the scholarly literature to the second exodus. As the first exodus was approximately 40 years in length, in leaving Egypt, going into the wilderness, wandering for 40 years before entering into the promised land, Joshua chapter 5. In the book of Revelation, we have the second exodus developed extensively. Listen, there is a wealth of material out there for those who are interested in pursuing this study that demonstrate how pervasive the ideas, the motifs, even the terminology of the first exodus is found in the book of Revelation. And I really truly believe that the second exodus it holds much of the key to properly understanding that the thousand years is actually a 40-year period of time. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail on that. However, I would recommend that you get Joseph Vincent's excellent book, The Millennium, Past, Present, or Future. Uh, Joseph done a fantastic job in that book. I understand that Joseph is currently revising and in editing and enlarging that. I was honored to be able to uh, write one chapter in that book. And it's my plan that at some point of time in the future, and I'll be taking a, a slightly different tack than Joseph does in his book, but I intend, Lord willing, and I get to live long enough, I intend to produce my own book, that will incorporate a lot of the material that I'm going to share with you today in demonstration of the 40-year millennium. But be sure to get your own copy of Joseph Vincent's book on the millennium, past, present, or future. It is in uh, the bookstore that Alan Morton has set up for the conference. Now, here's my premise. My premise is really quite simple, but it is really, really important to understand. What I'm going to share is going to be focused on just one of many, many arguments that I believe are definitive and powerful in proving the 40-year millennium. Now, I will share with you this. I am not aware of any commentary that approaches the millennium in the way that I'm going to suggest it to you today. And as I have said on many occasions, the occasions in the past, it absolutely scares me to death to present ideas and concepts and arguments that I cannot find at least the germ stated by some other writer. Listen, J. Stuart Russell in his book, The Parousia, struggled with the concept of the millennium. He never considered the idea never considered the argument that I'm going to present to you here today. And so while I certainly agree, I, I have stated on many, many occasions, we today are standing on the shoulders of the earlier giants. And yet, the millennium is, is a study that, to, to my knowledge, and listen, I, I, pref, I easily confess that this may be a matter of my own personal ignorance. 
It may be that others have essayed on the subject as I'm going to present it to you and that I simply have not been able to find them, even though I've examined a, a large, large number of commentaries, articles, PDFs, and what have you. I simply have not found anyone else that approaches the millennium in the way that I'm going to share it with you today. Thus, there is a reason, I believe there's a good solid reason why no one has essayed on the 40-year millennium in the way that I'm going to do it. Now, obviously, there are some who take the 40-year millennium. Joseph Vincent has done so. But I believe there's a really good reason why so many, the vast majority of commentators, do not even consider the idea of a 40-year millennium. Even though, by the way, there were some ancient rabbis who believed that the millennium was going to be 40 years. And that reason is very simple. It is universally believed and held and taught. Number one, that the millennium is a long period of time. And number two, it is assumed, basically without argumentation, that the millennium or that the end of the millennium is still future. So the two premises that underlie the futurist views are, are so fundamentally based upon assumptions. Number one, the millennium is a long period of time. Number two, the end of the millennium is yet future. And because of those assumptions, none of the futurist views seem to be willing to even consider the fact that the millennium was a short period of time, a symbolic reference to a perfect period of time, they seem not to have considered that it might be related to the second exodus, even though, strangely enough, many, many commentators take note of the second exodus motif in the book of Revelation. So my question is, if so many commentators take note of the second exodus motif in the book of Revelation, why in the world do they not see that the end of the second exodus is the entrance into the new creation, which it certainly was for the first exodus and Israel entering into the promised land. Why do they not consider that the end of the second exodus is the time of the resurrection from the dead, which Israel's deliverance from Egypt was resurrection from the dead? Why do these commentaries never consider these issues? Well, once again, I believe that it has to do with the fact that these commentators are so convinced that the millennium must be a long period of time and that the end of the millennium is therefore at the end of the, uh, the end of the millennium is a long way off therefore they never consider the things that I am going to share with you so my lesson is going to focus on a very specific motif that is undeniable, all right? And it's not only undeniable, it's admitted by all of these scholars who talk about the yet future end of the millennium. They admit the very motif that I'm going to share with you. And the reason they admit it is because it's right in the text of Revelation chapter 20 verse 8 and following. And that motif is this. The destruction of creation occurs at the end of the millennium. Now listen, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. All futurists, all of them, agree that heaven and earth is destroyed at the end of the millennium. Now, they are divided as to whether or not the creation is actually destroyed right down to the very elements. That's the kind of view that was in my fellowship of the churches of Christ, that the earth and the elements therein shall be burned up, not renovated, not restored, completely destroyed. But then there is the other, other view, sometimes uh, known as the Reformed Amillennial or the Postmillennial view, and that is that the earth will actually be renovated, restored. And the commentators appeal to Romans chapter 8, 21 and following for that view. 
But the bottom line is they are divided as to whether or not creation is actually destroyed or renovated. But, but they posit the destruction, they posit the renovation at the end of the current age or at the end of the millennium. In spite of that consensus, all right, in spite of that almost universal consensus, I believe that there is an incredible wealth of material that supports the idea of a 40-year millennium. So I'm going to begin with what I've just stated. And that is something that is admitted by all futurist paradigms, and that is that the destruction of heaven and earth is posited at the end of the millennium. So here's my argument, okay? I want you to follow along very carefully with my argument. Number one, point number one, the destruction of creation in the book of Revelation occurs at the end of the millennium. Now, I'll give you the text here momentarily. However, the destruction of creation in Revelation occurs at the time of the destruction of Babylon, the harlot city guilty of persecuting the saints, shedding all of the blood shed on the earth. In other words, to put this in another way, the end of the millennium is the time of the vindication of the martyrs. Now, let me reiterate this premise, okay? The destruction of creation of Revelation chapter 20 occurs at the time of the judgment of Babylon, the great persecuting power. We might put this as another way. The destruction of heaven and earth occurs at the time of, of the destruction of Satan, the great persecutor. But you see, Satan and Babylon were, well, I'll use the terminology, were partners. So the destruction of Satan and the destruction of Babylon are synchronous events. They both occur at the same time, i.e., at the end of the millennium. Third point. Babylon, in the book of Revelation, is Old Covenant Jerusalem. Therefore, the destruction of creation in the book of Revelation comes at the end of the millennium at the judgment of Old Covenant Jerusalem, which in the book of Revelation is identified as the adversary, i.e., Satan. Let me read that one more time. Therefore, the destruction of creation in Revelation comes at the end of the millennium. That's undeniable in Revelation 28 and follow. But it occurs at the judgment and the destruction of Babylon, the adversary, the Satan of God. So, we need to look at, and look, I'm sharing with you some important hermeneutical issues to set the context for what I'm going to develop during the, uh, during the rest of my presentation. When it comes to the book of Revelation, the eschatological world is divided into two camps. Number one, Revelation is viewed, and all of the visions, it's actually one vision, and John is made clear to know that, okay, there's only one vision. That alone should tell us something very important. But nonetheless, the, the futurist view of Revelation is divided into two camps, two views of the apocalypse. Number one, what is known as the recapitulatory perspective, and that is the book of Revelation is, as I just suggested, a single, vi a single vision, but that vision, that singular vision, is repeated, recapitulated, over and over and over again. In other words, the vision of the seals is repeated under the trumpets. And that, in turn, is reiterated in the vials. They are not different visions of different times, different events, stretched out, you know, the historicist view, which is the view I was taught in preacher school, stretches the book of Revelation out into millennia. I mean, spanning the entire 
vast scope of the last 200 years, extending into who knows how far into the future. And so they see it as sequential, just like the dispensationalists do. As a general rule, the premillennial view sees the book of Revelation as sequential. We have the seals, then we have the trumpets, then we have the vials. Strangely enough, they see the book of Revelation as pro focused primarily on a seven-year period of time. Now, that means that we've got all these visions, they make it plural instead of singular like the book says, all unfolding within an incredibly short period of time. But, as we shall see, if the book of Revelation is recapitulatory, that is the same vision presented in different, uh, different ways, then there is but one destruction of creation in the book. However, to return to the dispensational view just mentioned, if the book is chronologically sequential, there must of necessity be at least three, do you catch the power of this? There must be at least three destructions of heaven and earth in the book of Revelation. Now look, I'm not aware of any dispensational or premillennial view that admits and agrees and teaches that there are three destructions of creation in the book of Revelation. But, once again, if you take the book as sequential, chronologically sequential, you are absolutely forced to do so. Because as we will illustrate as we go along in my presentations, there, there are three mentions of the destruction of creation in the book of Revelation beginning with chapter 6, ending in chapter 20. Therefore, if chapter 6 follows, is followed by sequentially, chapter 16, for instance, which is followed sequentially and chronologically by chapter 20, then of absolute necessity, you have to have three destructions of heaven and earth. And yet, to my knowledge, no dispensationalist, no premillennialist has ever taught that. So I want to suggest to you that neither view can sustain a future end of the millennium or destruction of creation based upon the argument, my preliminary argument that I hope that you have written down. So let's take a look at Revelation. Now I'm going to begin with Revelation chapter 20, all right? Uh, may not be the proper place to start, but I want to start with something that is absolutely admitted by everyone. And that is that the destruction of heaven and earth occurs at the end of the millennium. Now, you need to star this, you need to underline it, you need to put it in caps that everyone agrees that the destruction of creation occurs at the end of the millennium. Let's begin reading with Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8. When the thousand years are expired, where does this put us? At the end of the millennium. Now, John sees the rebellion that takes place for a little while fire coming down from heaven, destroying the enemies uh, of the body of Christ. And then we have the great white throne judgment. So, when the thousand years are expired, John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and the one who sat on it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So here's what we have in the book of Revelation, specifically in chapter 20. We have the great white throne judgment when? at the end of the millennium. This is why I am starting at chapter 20, because this is absolutely incontrovertible. At that judgment, the great white throne judgment, the earth and the heaven fled away. So, end of the millennium, destruction of creation. At that judgment, at the end of the millennium, at the destruction of heaven and earth, the resurrection takes place. 
at that time, the dead are rewarded. Now, folks, the dead here are the martyrs of Revelation 20, 1 to 4. That means that Revelation chapter 20 is also the time of the vindication of the martyrs. And thus, heaven and earth pass away at the judgment, the resurrection, and the time of the vindication of the martyrs. Now, let me digress here for just a moment, all right? To address the issue that some believe that the millennium began in AD 70. Just very recently on Facebook, I have been accosted by two or three different people, and I use that word accost because they were, they were pretty harsh in their criticism. But nonetheless, they take the view, uh, you know, accusing me of ignorance, and I may be, but accusing me of ignorance and false doctrine, blah, 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 by positing the 40-year millennium and trying to argue that the millennium began, began in A.D. 70. Now, they believe this. They believe that Revelation 21 to 4, which is obviously the beginning of the millennium, speaks of the vindication of the martyrs of Christ in A.D. 70. They equate Revelation 6, the giving of the robes to the martyrs, who were told to rest for just a little while, so they equate the, the sitting on the thrones and waiting for the great judgment, waiting for the vindication, with the, with the receiving of the robes as they wait for their vindication. But they believe that Revelation 6, the giving of the robes, Revelation 20, the sitting on the thrones, was in A.D. 70, and that as a result of that, we have been in the millennium ever since. Now, some who take this position believe that the millennium is unending. Well, that can't be true according to Revelation 20 and verse 8, but nonetheless, I want you to pay very careful attention to what I'm, I'm about to share with you. Jesus posited the vindication of the martyrs at his coming in judgment of Jerusalem. Now, listen to me. He posited the vindication of the martyrs at AD 70. Matthew 21, the Lord of the vineyard would come against the wicked vineyard workers and destroy them. He would come and destroy them, vindicating the death of his servants and vindicating the death of his son. Matthew chapter 22, the invitation to the wedding went out. The servants who took that invitation were persecuted. The father sent out his armies, his representatives, it's his coming, and they destroy the city. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said that all of the blood of all of the righteous shed upon the earth from righteous Abel unto Zacharias, son of Barachias, would be vindicated in his generation. There is no question whatsoever that the vindication of the martyrs would be in AD 70. But watch this carefully. In Revelation 6, the martyrs are given robes after they cry out for vengeance. They are given robes and told to wait. To wait on what? Vindication. Robes given, waiting for vindication. So, it, once again, in Revelation 6, the martyrs are given robes and told to await their vindication at the great day of the Lord's wrath. They, they were, therefore, after receiving their robes, waiting for A.D. 70 and the coming of the Lord. Likewise, the great day of the Lord's wrath is, therefore, the day of their vindication, but that's not the, that is not the scene of Revelation 6, nor is it the scene of Revelation 21 to 4. To put this another way, A.D. 70 was the great day of God in vindication of the martyrs. But in Revelation 6 and in Revelation 20, the vindication of the martyrs, listen, listen, listen. The actual vindication awaits after they receive their robes, after they are seated on, on the thrones. They are given robes to wait for vindication. They are seated on the thrones to wait 
for vindication. Their vindication comes after they receive the thrones and the crowns, and their vindication comes at the end of the millennium and at the great day of the Lord. Now, all of that means that the great white throne judgment, which is after the millennium, is the time of the vindication. That means that in Revelation 6, after receiving their robes, they were waiting for the end of the millennium and the great day of God's wrath, the time of their vindication. It means that in Revelation 20, after being seated on thrones, they were waiting for their vindication that would come at the judgment at the end of the millennium. They were waiting for vindication. Revelation 21 to 4 is not A.D. 70. Revelation 6, 9 to 11 is not A.D. 70. It is the depiction of the saints, the martyrs, waiting for their vindication, which would occur at the end of the millennium. Now, once again, heaven and earth passes away, pass away at the great judgment. It is at that judgment that the martyrs are vindicated. To put this another way, heaven and earth passes away at the vindication of the martyrs. So what, what do we see? What do we see here in Revelation chapter 20? And boy, I'm running out of time really fast here. Okay. In Revelation chapter 20, here's what we have. The resurrection occurs at the end of the millennium. Nobody denies that. The judgment, and by the way, folks, let me just say this. In the Old Testament, vindication of martyrdom is depicted as resurrection. Now, since resurrection occurs at the end of the millennium, then since resurrection is depicted very often as vindication, that means that vindication at the day of the Lord, once again, did not occur at the giving of the robes or the seating on the thrones. It occurs after the millennium. But I could go on and on about that, but I don't have time. Okay, so the resurrection occurs at the end of the millennium. The judgment occurs at the end of the millennium. Nobody, nobody doubts that, right? The destruction of Satan occurs at the end of the millennium. Now listen, I, I've just got to make a statement or two right here. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan is depicted as the great serpent. That goes back to Isaiah chapter 27, Leviathan. Leviathan being destroyed. When? Verses 10 and following, when the fortified city would be destroyed, when the altar of the, of the temple would be turned to chalk stone, when the people whom the Lord had created would no longer find mercy in fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 32, the song of Moses, which is about Israel's last days, not about the end of time, not about the end of the Christian age. So, here in Revelation chapter 12, just like in Isaiah 26 and 27, Satan is depicted as the great enemy of God. Why? For persecuting the saints. So while, quote, Satan is depicted as the great persecutor in chapter 12, who is the great persecutor in Revelation 6, in Revelation 11, in Revelation 16, in Revelation 18 and 19? It is none other than Babylon. And thus, as I stated in my recent debate with Sam Frost, Satan means adversary. It means enemy, one who stands against. To deny that old covenant Babylon was, quote, Satan, the enemy and the adversary of God in the book of Revelation, flies against everything, everything that the book of Revelation has to say. So I would like to, I would like to develop that an awful lot more. I think that Scott Fisher is going to develop this concept, so I don't want to walk on him too terribly much. But I do want to notice this. I pointed out in my debate with Sam Frost, 
when he scoffed at the idea of Satan being destroyed in A.D. 70. I said, well, the problem is that Paul said in Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, and now the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. And by the way, it's not unknown at all in the commentaries for the scholars to understand that Paul was not talking about a spiritual being, but the, but the enemy of God, i.e. the Jews, who were persecuting the church at that time. That's not unknown at all in the literature. So this entire subject of the destruction of Satan at the end of the millennium is extremely important, but I must hasten on. So at the end of the millennium, we have the resurrection, we have the judgment, we have the destruction of Satan, and we have the avenging of the martyrs. Remember, Revelation 20, they were given robes, they were told to, to wait, they waited for the millennium, and at the end of the millennium, Satan, their great persecutor, is destroyed. That is their vindication, and they get to enter into the new creation at the end of the millennium. And obviously, we have the destruction of heaven and earth at the end of the millennium. Now, I don't know of anyone, I don't know of anyone that denies and rejects these basic tenets. Now, <laughs> obviously, Sam Frost didn't know how to deal with the destruction of Satan in the book of Revelation. He, he didn't know how to deal with the identity of Satan in the book of Revelation. All he could do was scoff at it, ridicule it. But folks, I want to tell you something. Ridicule is not reputation, as I've pointed out many, many times. So once again, few commentators disagree with the assessment that I've just given of the constituent elements that are found in Revelation chapter 20, all of which occur at the end of the millennium. Now, we need to set the stage for our next passage. Our next text. The, the very next passage that I want to deal with is Revelation chapter 16, which discusses and describes the destruction of heaven and earth. Now, it doesn't mention the millennium, all right? And it doesn't say destruction of heaven and earth. I'll have more to say about that. But in order to understand Revelation 16, we have to set the context and the context is actually set in Revelation 15. But notice first that Revelation 16, 17 to 21 is the outpouring of the seventh bowl, the seventh vial of the, of the wrath of God. And that wrath of God, that outpouring of the seventh bowl is depicted as the great day of God's wrath and catch the power of this. That great day of God's wrath in Revelation 16 in the outpouring of the seventh bowl is against Babylon, the great persecutor of the saints. Now then, keep that in mind, okay, as we turn back to Revelation chapter 15 in order to set the stage in order to set the context for chapter 16. Now remember, chapter 16 is the outpouring of seven bowls, or the seventh bowl, I should say. In Revelation 15 and 8, John saw the temple of God open in heaven, as he had seen in Revelation chapter 11, 19. In Revelation 19, he said, I saw the temple in heaven opened, and there was the ark of the testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, but no man could enter therein. Well, in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8, we are told that no man could enter into that naos, naos meaning the most holy place, until the wrath of God found in the seven bowls was completed, was poured out. Okay? So, we have here in Revelation chapter 11, chapter 15, we have the motif of the seven bowls of God's wrath. The seventh bowl is the day, the great day of God's wrath. And this is what's critical. It is against Babylon, the great persecutor. But wait a minute. 
What does Revelation chapter 12 do? Revelation 12 identifies the great persecutor as the devil, Satan, the great serpent. So, Revelation 12, the great persecutor is Satan. Revelation 16 and 17, yes, 16 and 17, actually through 18. The great persecutor is Babylon. Satan is Babylon. Now, all of this means that no man could enter into the most holy place until the wrath of God was completely poured out against Babylon when creation would be destroyed. But when is creation destroyed in the book of Revelation? <laughs> at the end of the millennium. So let's look at this very closely in Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 4 to 7 and then 18 to 20 for time's sake. The third angel, the, that's the third bowl, poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became as blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, O Lord, who, who was and are and shall be, because you have judged. For they... This is the city of Babylon. They have shed the blood of the saints and of the prophets. You have given them blood to drink. You see, this is what is known as the lex talionis, blood for blood. Pain for pain, persecution for persecution. You have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another, uh, another, another angel out of the altar. Now, as we're going to see, the altar is critical because it's under the altar where the martyrs are. I heard another out of the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then, the seventh angel. Now, so I'm jumping ahead in time here, admittedly. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as has, um, such a mighty and great earthquake as not ever occurred since men were on the earth. Now, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now watch. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So what do we have here? We have the judging of the great persecutor, Babylon, which is the harlot city. Now, a very, very quick observation. When it says that Babylon was remembered, that is from a word that indicates covenantal remembrance. It is like remembering a marriage covenant. It is far, far more than a simple, you know, I remember when I was 12 years old, which is hard to do. But anyway, it, it's not just simple mental recollection. It is bringing covenant to mind. Abra uh, God remembered his, uh, his covenant with Abraham. Do you see how important that is? God remembered Babylon. That means that he was in a covenant relationship with Babylon and the provisions of that covenant, the provisions of wrath, for her violation of that covenant were going to be brought to bear. Now, folks, there was only one city that was ever in covenant relationship with God. And that was not the Vatican. It was, wasn't New York. It wasn't America. And it wasn't Rome. It was Old Covenant Jerusalem. So, we have here <clears throat> in Revelation chapter 16, the judging of the great persecutor Babylon, the harlot city. Now, notice that in verse 7, the altar sings praises to the Lord for vindicating the blood of the saints. So, the destruction of Babylon is the vindication of the saints. But the great white throne judgment is the vindication of the martyrs of God. This also echoes chapter 6, the souls who are under the altar crying out for vindication. So chapter 16 is just another view of their vindication at the destruction of Babylon, the slayer of the prophets and the servants of God. But watch, this is the great day of God's wrath described in Revelation 6, 12 and following. 
just as it's described in Revelation 16 and 7. It is the answer to the prayer of the martyrs of chapter 6. Thus, the great day of the Lord's wrath against Babylon is the time of the vindication of the martyrs. But wait a minute. That means it's the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, which occurs at the end of the millennium. Now watch. Oh, i got to hurry. <clears throat> we are told, quote, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Obviously, the term heaven and earth is not found here as it is found in Revelation 20. But folks, we're not talking about two different judgments, two separate vindication of the martyrs, and two separate great days of the Lord. This is just typical Hebraic expressions. There is absolutely no rule of journalism that demands that every single expression, every exact word, term, or phrase be used from text to text to describe the same identical events. That, that, that's really, after all, ludicrous. But after all, if the mountains are not found, and if the islands have fled away, that is an earth-shattering event, to be sure. Well, I'm absolutely out of time. We will, uh, we will summarize what we have seen on Revelation 16 in my second lesson, and we will proceed from there in our survey of the book of Revelation and the end of the millennium destruction of heaven and earth. Thank you very much. Well, all right, here we are. Uh, this concludes night one, the first two lessons of Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. I have to tell you, I really, really appreciate the fact that Daniel is tying in the eschatology of Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, with the overall uh, vision of eschatology in the book of Revelation. I've got to tell you a quick story here. When I was still at the Maxwell Church of Christ here in Ardmore years ago, we started a class on the book of Revelation. The elders decided to do it on a Sunday night since there was pretty good interest in it. And we started out, now you have to keep in mind, we were a congregation of around 350 to 400 at the time. So we started out with that size and very, very quickly, attendance started coming up. Interest was growing. And I have to tell you, I did not take a dogmatic stand on the dating or the application to the book of Revelation. I just simply said, now here's the traditional view. Here's the way that I was raised, but through study, here's where I have I've seen some additional evidence. This is where I'm leaning. Make up your own mind. Again, I was not dogmatic. In a very, very short period of time, our attendance grew to over 300 people on a Sunday night. We actually had people driving from over 100 miles to attend that class. And it was continuing to grow. Well, you know, there were some people who didn't like what they were hearing. So they went to the elders and they complained. And the elders came to me and said, oh, look, look Don, we, we've got to discontinue this class. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, uh, we're just getting too many questions about what you're teaching. I said, brethren, isn't that fantastic? Don't we want people asking questions? Don't we want people interested in what the Bible teaches? Well, yeah, but, you know, uh, we, we, just, we, we just can't have what's, what's going on here. And I said, let me ask you a question, brethren. When was the last time that this congregation had in its entire history over, uh, one night we actually reached 330 some, if memory serves me correctly. I said, when was the last time we'd over, over 300 people attending a Bible class on a Sunday night, some people driving for over a hundred miles one way just to get here to attend the class. And they kind of nervously looked at each other and they finally one of them said, well, we've, we've just never had that. Well, we'll think about it, but we got to do something here. Well, uh, you know, a couple of weeks passed and interest continued to grow 
and people were getting excited. Yes, some were upset. And finally, the elders called me in and they said, look, Don, we, we just got to put a stop to this. We just can't have this. So I reiterated my concerns over stopping that. And I said, brethren, why would you want to stop something that is causing such interest? Well, we just can't have this. And I said, so you're going to stop this class before we ever even get into the text of the book in any serious way. Well, yeah, we just got to do something. And so they said, let us talk about it, Don. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with something in the book of Revelation that you don't have to deal with eschatology. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I didn't say anything. But the following Wednesday, one of the elders called me to his house and he said, okay, Don, we got it all figured out. We've decided what you can teach on from the book of Revelation and you will not have to deal with eschatology. I said, really? I said, what is that? He said, letters to the seven churches. Just focus on the letters to the seven churches and you won't have to deal with eschatology. And I said, brother, did you guys give this a lot of thought? Oh, he said, we, sure, we certainly did. We gave it a lot of thought. And I said, well, you got your Bible laying there. Let me ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 2. And I marched them through each of the letters to the seven churches and focused on the sayings, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast until I come. I said, now, let me ask you a question. You said you don't want me teaching on eschatology. But I've just shown you from the letters to the seven churches, which you say don't deal with eschatology, I've just shown you that eschatology permeates the text. And he sat there with his Bible open just staring at it. And he finally looked up at me and he said, Don, I don't have an idea in the world what to tell you. He said, obviously, we didn't think much about this. And I said, well, you're right, you didn't. He said, well, I'll just have to get back with you before Sunday. So on Sunday morning, one of the elders drew me aside and he said, well, Don, here's what we've decided. Uh, uh, teach on the letters to the seven churches, and when you come to eschatology, just mention it, but don't focus on it. I said, how am I supposed to do justice to the letters to the seven churches and yet essentially ignore the major focus of, uh, of exhortation in each of the letters to the seven churches. And he said, well, I don't know how you're going to handle it, but that's what we want you to do. Well, I taught the letters to the seven churches and they fired me. They realized very, very quickly that you cannot teach Revelation, and that includes the letters to the seven churches, as Daniel has shown. You can't teach about the letters to the seven churches without teaching on eschatology the entire book of Revelation. So I appreciate Daniel's introductory lesson. I hope you enjoyed my very first lesson on the destruction of creation and the end of the millennium. I hope you can see how important that, that single motif is for determining the time of the end of the millennium. And there'll be two more lessons on that. In the meantime, thanks again. Hey, I appreciate all of you who are watching online. And of course, the, these uh, lectures will be available in the coming months and they'll be, they'll be there, quote, forever. And so hopefully they will bring some clarity to, to the understanding of the book of Revelation. Thank you very much.